Welcome, one and all. I am Dr. William Lanson. I'm the chair of philosophy here at UNO. Last fall, UNO Philosophy launched our Brains, Minds, and Machines lecture series. So it's my honor to welcome you to part two of that series, what I like to call the revenge of the Brains, Minds, and Machines <laughs> lecture series. I want to start by thanking our colloquium committee of Dr. Jan Sel Garcia, our tech expert. Uh, Dr. Robert Seale, who will be handling our online uh, issues, and especially Dr. Joe McCaffrey for uh, all of their work organizing this event. Now, first of all, everybody, silence your cell phones. <laughs> We're very excited to offer two great speakers with us today, an auspicious day for philosophy, the 198th birthday of Immanuel Kant today. Oh, <laughs> So uh, just FYI, we'll use our usual uh, system of we'll have our speakers talk for about 50 minutes, followed by about a 30 minute Q&A. Then we'll have a little uh, uh, five minute break in between a very short five minute break. We're going to try to keep it to about five minutes. Uh, and then we'll have our second speaker. So, uh, oh, and before I get started, I want to take this moment to plug philosophy at UNO. If you haven't thought of taking a philosophy class at UNO, these will be up front during the intermission. These are a list of our summer and fall courses. Come talk to any faculty member about these. We offer a range of great courses here. Even better, come talk about majoring or minoring in philosophy. Okay, now, with that said, let me introduce our first speaker. Mr. Rafa Perez is coming to us from the University of Rochester, where he's a graduate student working in the philosophy of mind and metaphysics. <laughs> His dissertation is titled Plex Durantism, a Partless Version of Four Dimensionalism. Rafa was scheduled to join us for the very first part of our speaker series, but uh, the airlines conspired against him, and thus the revenge in the revenge of the Brains Minds lecture series. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Rafa Press, who talks about modular minds and chimp mentality. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for having me, uh, especially Yanso, Joe, uh, and William. Um, it's it's been really fun getting to know you guys. I uh, hope we can keep talking a lot. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, some issues in animal cognition, specifically some issues that that come up with uh, how we. Uh, try to interpret some of the experimental results um, that we derive, uh, particularly with chips. Um, and some of the ways that we try to deal with, with these problems and uh, there we go. So like I said, some experimental results regarding the uh, mental abilities of chimps uh, have prompted a long debate about how to like we should interpret these results. Uh, some, like uh, Tomasello and Cole, uh, argue that these results indicate that uh, indicate that primates have uh, mind reading abilities. Uh, that's a philosopher's term. Uh, scientists often refer to that as theory of mind. Um, so. All it is basically is that they form beliefs about the mental states uh, of conspecifics, uh, maybe even humans. Um, and this hypothesis grants chimps the abilities to reason uh, about their mental states um, and often about what behaviors likely follow these mental states. Um, and one of these abilities uh, is referred to as perspective taking. Um, and that's just the ability to reason about the what other chimps' perceptions are and um, the likely behavior uh, that that follows uh, what it perceives. But uh, others like Papinelli and Bonk uh, argue that uh, the same uh, results uh, indicate that, well, they, they fit better with what's called a behavior reading analysis um, equally well, at least. Um, and this, this is known as the logical problem. And I'll be talking about that a little bit down the line. Um, and the behavior reading uh, hypothesis doesn't grant chimps these higher order mental uh, processes. Instead, it explains the results uh, purely in, in terms of 
um, associating behavioral cues with uh, with other behavior. Um, and you know, it's an important distinction. Uh, instead of reasoning about mental, like the mental states of kind specifics, they reason only about the behaviors and um, behaviors that are linked to other behaviors. Uh, so, um, problem uh, chimps consist. Well, problem for the uh, mind reading hypothesis is that uh, chimps consistently fail mind reading experiments in cooperative contexts. Um, and Carruthers and Fletcher uh, propose that uh, this failure can be accounted for by uh, recognizing that chimps, uh, that, that their mind reading faculties are carried out by uh, modular systems. Uh, and therefore, chimps still mind read, just not in cooperative contexts. Uh, I'll argue that this appeal uh, to modularity produces a dilemma and ultimately doesn't help the mind reading hypothesis. And I instead propose that um, supporters of the, of the mind reading hypothesis should take a different approach to the problem uh, that these cases um, bring up. So I'll quickly go over some, some of the experiments. Uh, I've attached a helpful little diagram for you guys. Um, so a hair at uh, at all uh, tested for this perspective, uh, perspective taking ability by placing a dominant and subordinate uh, chimps at opposite uh, opposite ends of the room. Uh, in the room, they placed one piece of food that was visible to uh, both chimps, and and the other there was uh, there was a barrier hiding that food from the dominant, uh, but the subordinate could see it. Um, and the experimenters reason that if the subordinate was capable of these, these perspective taking abilities, uh, they would prefer the food uh, item behind the barrier, uh, precisely because the, they, it would understand that the dominant couldn't see it. Um, and the subordinate was released before the dominant uh, to rule out that the subordinate chose, just chose the food uh, uh, that the uh, dominant didn't go for. Um, and the subordinate, as it turns out, did in fact demonstrate a preference for the food that the dominant couldn't see. And to strengthen the results, they placed the barrier hiding. Uh, well, they replaced the barrier, the opaque barrier with a clear barrier. Uh, and then the subordinate didn't show any preference for, for either piece of food. Uh, So this is a problem. The majority of successful experiments attempting to show uh, mind reading in chimps and other non-human animals have been conducted uh, primarily in competitive contexts. Uh, and attempts to replicate those results in cooperative contexts have mostly proven unfruitful. Um, and this suggests uh, something that uh, either chimps lack some of these mind reading abilities or for some reason they only use them in competitive contexts. Um, and some like Pavanelli and Eddie have carried out their own experiments and uh, they claim that their studies show that uh, while chimpanzees do uh, follow the gaze of others, um, their concept of perception uh, doesn't include anything about intentionality. Um, and in, in these experiments, the chimps had a choice between begging for food from an experimenter uh, whose vision wasn't obstructed and, and, and uh, another experimenter who's, who's, who had like a bucket on his head, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they found that the chimps didn't prefer to beg from the experimenter whose uh, vision was unobstructed. Um, and this inability to use their supposed mind reading abilities in cooperative contexts or, or extend uh, a learned cue to modified cues uh, indicates a problem for the mind reading hypothesis. Um, given a domain general understanding of the minds of uh, chimps uh, and humans, it's expected that they'd be capable of performing uh, those abilities in both contexts. Now, uh, when, when humans reason about the mental states of, of others, they're not typically limited to a particular context. Uh, this suggests that humans' ability to reason about the mental states of others is carried out by, by general and flexible systems. And it is reasonable to expect that if they do have these abilities, um, that they make use of them in contexts where they would be useful for, uh, to them. Um, and 
this is related to uh, to a part of the, the discourse where uh, where uh, you know people on both sides of the debate, mind reading, behavior reading, they appeal to the evolutionary basis for uh, for their hypothesis. And I won't be taking sides on whether or not uh, chimps uh, mind reading abilities are are modular or not. Uh, or whether they have the abilities. I'll just be looking at that, uh, at whether a particular response to this um, is good for, my, for the mind readers. Um, so Carruthers and Fletcher uh, argue that this discrepancy poses no objection to, to mind reading. Uh, if we conceive of uh, mind reading abilities of chimps to be realized by domain specific modular systems. Um, and if these abilities are, uh, in chimps are realized by modular mechanisms, which are specialized to inputs from competitive contexts, uh, it's unsurprising uh, that they uh, wouldn't be activated uh, in, uh, by inputs in co uh, cooperative contexts. At least we can offer an explanation of why, why, why that would be the case and it would make sense if, if they uh, have these systems that are only receptive to, to inputs from uh, competitive contexts. So a bit about uh, modules and modular systems. I'll be talking about uh, specifically about M1 and M2 modules, uh, what I call them. They correspond, uh, some of you may, uh, I'm sure many of you have, have heard of uh, Fodorian modules, uh, Carruther, uh, Carruthering modules. Um, basically, M1 modules are mostly like how Fodor would conceive of them. Um, and he provides a big list like of nine properties of modules. Um, and roughly speaking, I'll be, I'll be talking about M1 modules as those that uh, correspond to, or like at least have most of, uh, uh, of that list of nine uh, properties. Um, and M2, uh, M2 modules and systems, I'll be referring to how Carruthers conceives of them, and I'll say a bit more about that. Um, but uh, roughly, these are some of the, I won't, I won't go through the whole list because um, it's not really relevant. Some of them aren't too relevant to, to what we'll be talking about today, but um, perhaps the most important uh, property that all modules have uh, in both senses is domain specificity. And that's a property of modules. That means that they're limited with respect to the range of things they can process. Um, so their process is uh, processing is restricted to a narrow domain of information. Um, and uh, another one, modules are fired automatically when triggered by an input. That's also important. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about that. Uh, modules are innate in that they they're formed according uh, to internally determined uh, models that are usually triggered by environmental factors. Um, another very important uh, set of properties is informational encapsulation and inaccessibility to central processing. And these involve the flow of information uh, in and out of a module. Um, encapsulation of a module is the extent to which uh, information is restricted from entering uh, the module from sources outside of itself. Um, and inaccessibility is a restriction on central processing or conscious uh, consciousness to access the information and process within a module. Um, lastly, uh, shallowness in a module uh, means that they require very little computational power because of uh, narrow informational content and outputs, uh, specifically outputs. Um, there is said that uh, the, mod, the, the output of a module is shallow when it's, or typically when it's, um, you know, non-conceptual um, uh, content, usually. Um, and this property of modules helps explain some of the functions that they fulfill, and it gives modules one of the properties needed uh, for arguments about uh, computationally economical mechanisms, uh, are, that are said to fa be favored by evolution. Um, you probably noticed that uh, this is a list of what we think of as distinct properties, um, but it, it's. I think it's pretty clear that these are uh, interconnected and rough, like in some sense, a function of each other. 
So it's not like you can just, or at least for some of them, it's not like you could change, like you could change or you can have a module that has uh, one of these properties, but not the other. Um, there are there there are some that you can uh, um, you, you can think of some modules as, as having some of them and not others, but there are some sets like uh, encapsulation and, and shallowness that are uh, very closely related to each other. Um, so when you have uh, when you have a module that doesn't output shallow uh, content, uh, that's reason to think that that module can't be highly encapsulated, uh, for example. So, the prop, especially as Fodor conceived of them, pop, uh, the properties of M1 modules make them suitable only for explaining lower level uh, cognition, like perception, language, comprehension, other peripheral systems. Uh, and these are automatically triggered, domain specific. Uh, their information is inaccessible to central cognition and immune to triggering and deactivation by intentional processes. Uh, and a classic example uh, is the of an M1 module is is usually given as the uh, Mueller liar illusion. And you can introspect about it if you want. Um, the illusion persists even after you form the true belief that the lines are the same length. Um, I don't know if those are actually the same length, but <laughs> so massive modularity theorists like Carruthers uh, attempt to explain all or most cognitive processes uh, in terms of modules uh, by extending a weaker conception uh, of modularity to higher order cognition. And they do that just by conceiving of uh, modules with with uh, fewer of the properties that Fodor uh, ascribes to to modules. And according to Carruthers, uh, M two modules don't have uh, the properties, uh, for example, shallowness or complete encapsulation. Uh, they're domain specific, uh, mandatory processes using. Uh, what he calls proprietary algorithms, and um, and massive modularity theories do this precisely because um, they want um, modules uh, to be able to take in conceptual inputs from other modules, um, and therefore they build on each other, and they it, it starts to resemble. Uh, it starts to resemble something that can be plausibly said to or thought of as uh, you know fulfilling some of these uh, some of these faculties in higher order cognition. Um, so here's the possible solution to to some of these uh, anomalies we see in, in some of these uh, studies. Um, and Carruthers says uh, that. Well, maybe I'll skip that. So the finding is said to be problematic for the claim that they possess, uh, possess such capabilities at all, but it only raises a difficulty for the mentalizing hypothesis when the, on the assumption that mind reading would involve uh, some sort of general purpose theory embedded in a general purpose mind. Uh, if that were the case, then it would be puzzling uh, if a chimp might draw on a set of beliefs about, uh, uh, about the mind in the service of one sort of goal, but not another. Um, uh, but if one holds even a weakly modular conception of the architecture of, uh, say, chimps, then the puzzle disappears. Um, for in that case, certain types of goal might have proprietary links to certain informational modules uh, while ignoring the output from other such modules. No. So the chimpanzees' failure to extend their mind reading to non-competitive uh, context is a problem for, uh, for the mind reading hypothesis only if we insist that they're being fulfilled by a global uh, flexible domain general mechanism. Um, but if the MRI theorists, uh, as Carruthers uh, does, instead claims that chimpanzee brains fulfill their mind reading abilities through domain specific modules, uh, then we can actually expect some of these failures. Um, chimp mind reading modules would therefore have competitive, uh, competitive context domains while being unreceptive to some or all co uh, cooperative context inputs. 
So, so does M1 modularity help the mind reading hypothesis as Fodor conceived of it? Um, so, it's easy to think that mind reading faculties are domain general, or at least carried out by domain specific modules that fulfill a, a process that appears to be domain general, uh, non reflexive, and uh, unencapsulated. <clears throat> And uh, MRI series like Thomas Elo and Call assign understanding to chimps of goals and intentions, knowledge of others, uh, and systems with domain specificity, high encapsulation, and fast processing produce uh, shallow outputs. Uh, so M1 modules are computation, uh, computationally economical precisely because of shallow non-conceptual outputs. Uh, Yeah, there we go. Um, and this is because of uh, what's known as a logical problem for any supposed observation uh, of mind reading, a purely behavior reading analysis will explain and predict behaviors as well as the mind reading hypothesis while attributing less beliefs. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's more parsimonious than MRH. Um, so the MRH attributes three types of beliefs uh, to the subordinate chimp, uh, belief about the dominance of observable cues, the uh, belief about the association between uh, the cues and its mental states, and they believe about the dominance mental states uh, and likely behavior. Uh, and while the, the behavior reading analysis attributes only two types of beliefs, there's uh, the belief about the observable cues and a belief about the association between the cues and likely behavior. And uh, this goes along with, with the idea uh, Simon Fitzpatrick expressed um, that attributing higher level mentalistic uh, concepts such as um, that of uh, visual awareness um, allows us to avoid attributing uh, to subjects like the subordinate um, a cluster of rules that specify one-to-one -one mapping between uh, particular observable cues and predictions about how other uh, uh, others are going to behave in specific circumstances, or at least that's what uh, the mind-reading hypothesis is trying to get at. So if a uh, uh, mind-reading hypothesis uh, theorist uses M1 modules, uh, the narrow domain, high encapsulation, and uh, very shallow outputs could have been committed to a separate module and therefore um, separate computational algorithms for very ra uh, narrow ranges of uh, competitive inputs. Um, and it looks to me like this puts uh, the mind reading hypothesis at a uh, disadvantage uh, with respect to the logical problem. Um, and it may force uh, them to commit to something uh, not far off uh, to that one-to-one -one mapping that, that they try to avoid by attributing these uh, higher order uh, systems. So, I guess so does the uh, M2 uh, modules uh, help MRH? Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Carruthers does make a, a few changes. So he eliminates things like proprietary uh, transducers, shallow outputs, um, fast processing, uh, things like uh, innateness, um, and uh, particularly encapsulation or high encapsulation. Um, and so he, uh, he ends up with properties that are, um, you know, function specific, um, uh, definitely domain specific, uh, and whose operations are uh, automatic and not subject to uh, control by, by consciousness. Um, and so they are weakly encapsulated enough to allow information from other parts of cognition, so other modules to penetrate it and to, to make use of that. 
and uh, they're accessible to other modules, uh, accounting for the uh, central monitoring that we know to be expressed during high, some higher order processes like mind reading, and they aren't limited to producing only shallow outputs, uh, so they can issue in uh, in uh, complex states that are usually expected from from reasoning processes. Uh, and but one thing to note here is that it's already looking like there's some tension with respect to how a system can count as unencapsulated while remaining domain specific. Uh, I mentioned uh, briefly some uh, some of the ways these properties can be intertwined and co uh, or uh, codependent. But I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a bit. So I think that this produces a dilemma for uh, for the mind reading hypothesis and those that want to use this uh, Carruthers strategy uh, to explain away these failures of, of some of these chimps. Um, and I think it might undermine uh, Carruthers' intention for using modules in the first place. Um, so the first horn is that if the encapsulation in a mind reading module is high, then it explains why a module uh, has a limited domain, like with uh, like with chimp mind reading. Uh, but it means it can't uh, be used to fulfill uh, mind reading for the same sorts of reasons that uh, that M1 modules can't be used for, uh, which I just mentioned before. Um, and the second horn is that if the encapsulation is low, uh, like in the Carruthers style module, then it uh, can fulfill the mechanism for mind reading uh, by operating on complex information and producing complex content outputs, uh, but then it doesn't explain uh, why the ability cannot be uh, extended uh, to other contexts since this sort of system resembles like a global tool with access to a wide range of information. Um, so the thought here is that M2 modules have the properties that they have because we want them to provide the features uh, we see in higher order cognition uh, and domain general processes. Uh, so basically, if they're too much like M1 modules, then they risk not being sufficient bases for the sorts of processes that are ne necessary when carrying out mind reading, like issuing in complex conceptual states. Uh, and if they're too much like M2 modules, uh, then there's doubt as to how exactly this would help uh, account for the lack of chimp mind reading uh, abilities in cooperative contexts. So this is basically how, how I see the dilemma. Um, but there is uh, something Carruthers can say in response or others. Um, and he does so. Uh, he does, uh, well, he doesn't actually respond to this. I've never sent him my paper, but, uh, but he does respond to a concern uh, uh, Curie and uh, Sorelny uh, pose to mind reading and humans in general. Uh, so I think he can say something similar about this, this problem. Um, and that's, uh, he says, at the outset of this line of thought, however, is a mistaken conception of what central process modularity is in general. They take it to be the view that there are modules which serve to fix belief. And one way in which this is wrong, of course, is that many modulists believe, believe in the existence of central process modules which serve to generate desires and emotions. Um, and he says the best way of explaining what a central process is is uh, for the purpose for these purposes is not that it's one that adventures in beliefs, but rather it is one that which operates upon conceptual contents or conceptualized states. And there may well be central modules with which uh, issue neither in beliefs nor desires or emotions, but which uh, rather deliver conceptualized states which can feed the uh, pro further into further processes, which then issue in. Uh, full-blown propositional attitudes. So it's a bit big. Uh, the way I, I've thought about this is that um, belief fixation during my reading is, is only a product after a modular system has carried out uh, some automatic conceptual processing. And understood in this way, the process of belief fixation uh, may or may not be modular, but the, but the mind reading mechanism is. Um, and uh, so conceptualized states are fed by mind reading modules into further systems, which then themselves issue in full-blown beliefs. Um, 
And if these uh, modules that issue in these conceptualized states have a sufficiently restricted uh, domain and are encapsulated enough to trigger these re representations only in competitive um, context, then it might explain why, uh, explain how uh, MRH can retain mind reading in chimps and account for their failure to extend these abilities in other contexts. So, as I see it, the uh, the problem uh, is, is still there. We can ask uh, at least two questions about it. Uh, the first is um, about the extent to which uh, central modules that deliver uh, conceptual states are themselves encapsulated in shallow, because um, they are supposed to be modules. Um, and if they are highly encapsulated, their outputs might be too shallow uh, to resemble conceptual states. Uh, since chimp mind reading appears to be carried out by a highly encapsulated system because they're uh, because they deal in a very limited uh, range of inputs, uh, we can reason that central conceptual modules likely produce uh, shallow and non-conceptual outputs. Uh, so there's no conceptual content to feed into uh, belief issuing modules. Uh, the second question is that if these modules can operate on and uh, eventuate. Uh, I didn't phrase these as questions at all, so ignore that. <laughs> uh, if these modules can operate on eventuate and eventuate in conceptual uh, content, then they are only domain specific in the sense that there's some non-modular executive system that selects uh, what inputs to feed uh, to them, uh, maybe by relevance. Uh, if so, then this executive system for some reason chooses to ignore inputs from uh, uh, cooperative context. Um, and Carruthers does um, consider that uh, his account of mod uh, mod uh, modularity will uh, require a non-modular executive system like this. Um, but uh, one thing uh, to note um, is that uh, about the second question, uh, not everyone, uh, not everyone uh, who supports the massive modularity theory thinks that. Um, you need these sorts of, uh, you know, general uh, uh, executive systems. Uh, for example, Barrett suggests the possibility that um, instead of a domain general routing system, uh, this routing is instead carried out by uh, outputs themselves activating uh, the central system that operates on that domain. I think it's called something like uh, enzymatic uh, something or other, but um, basically the idea is instead of a like a central system actually uh, making decisions about where to route uh, inputs into other modules, um, instead you have this pooling of outputs by central modules and then uh, the outputs themselves are with, by their presence, they trigger uh, the further uh, modules that operate within that domain. Um, I don't have too much to say about that. Uh, there are interesting questions about that. Um, but I don't really have time to go into it too much right now. Um, so I, I think the problem persists um, because of these reasons. And some of the further concerns I have uh, is that um, the minds, in human, uh, the minds of humans and chips uh, might be modular. Uh, however, we need uh, better, if we take this approach, we need better explanations about how the properties of modules can give us what we need uh, to attribute mind reading to chimps while uh, explaining away their failures. And you know, chimps are supposed to be capable of understanding goals, intentions, perceptions, and knowledge of others. Um, and they might be capable of that. Uh, but I think that there are significant worries about taking some of these experiments at face value and trying to explain them away by appealing to modules. Um, and perhaps a better approach uh, for um, the mind reading hypothesis supporters is to uh, insist that so far uh, our experiments simply haven't been successful in creating the conditions necessary uh, to draw these abilities out uh, in chips. And uh, 
if they turn out to be able to mind read in cooperative contexts, this, this would fit better with the fact that chimps are highly social creatures who often do cooperate. <laughs> um, and the modular explanation of chimp cognition might still be appropriate, but it might just turn out that innate modules need to be nurtured uh, by social interactions, uh, which is not something that uh, lab, chip, uh, lab chimps typically receive. And uh, Kristen Andrews has a great paper on this about false belief experiments and how most of our experiments uh, in, in these fields have been focused on false belief, uh, where there might be other uh, features of, of belief that we should explore uh, with respect to mind reading. Um, so if I'm right, does that mean that it's impossible for something to have an ability like mind reading and only be, uh, have it only be triggered by in certain contexts? Uh, this is implausible. Um, no, I think it's certainly plausible, uh, possible for that limited faculty to be had, but it, it, the, the problem I have with that is that it calls into question uh, that this is what's going on, given the sorts of claims made by supporters of, of the mind reading hypothesis including the fact that it's supposed to be uh, parsimonious, uh, evolutionarily economical or developed. Um, because this, this little uh, side debate isn't going on like independent of all the other claims that mind reading like theorists need uh, for them to be right. Um, they have to consider how their response uh, to this problem uh, uh, bears on the responses to the logical problem and other related issues. Um, so uh, it, it gets a little bit complicated and there's more things to consider. You can't just say anything. Uh, we all know. Uh, besides this, my concern isn't whether or not chimps have mind reading abilities. It's simply uh, that there are problems with appealing to modules and accounting for, for the failures. Uh, in how they extend these abilities to cooperative context. And of course, this all hinges on, on some other related issues. So questions like, uh, in humans, are different systems responsible for uh, different mind reading abilities? I think that our answers to these sorts of questions would bear on uh, how we might think that chimps, chimp mind reading might, might occur. Um, uh, and there's certainly some evidence of this, uh, that this could be the case. So young children can mind read desire, but can't mind read belief. Um, that also gets a little bit complicated. You know, you might think that some of these uh, uh, systems are responsible for both, but that you need, just need some time for, uh, for some part of that system to catch up or, or just needs more development. Um, but, um, and another is chimps don't seem to engage in reasoning about belief, uh, but there are experiments that provide some evidence that they reason about perception. Um, so if you already uh, think that uh, they have some uh, mind reading abilities, why not accept that they reason about perception in co uh, competitive context, but not cooperative context? And again, I think that the issue here is that this doesn't fit well with all the uh, parsimony arguments that um, MRH supporters give. So, I'll conclude by reiterating some of the some of the things uh, that I think the the my reading hypothesis has available to it that are a little bit little bit better than just taking these um, experiments at face value. So, so maybe uh, something better for the uh, MRH supporters to say is that some of these experiments suggest suggest that they have the ability, but we still need more and better experiments in cooperative contexts. Um, so. Um, many of these experiments are, uh, that are performed may not be just may not be suited to, to bring these mind reading abilities out as uh, Kristen Andrews suggests. Um, and you know lab chimps aren't often exposed to the sort of uh, social environments that they need uh, where they would be able to develop uh, these abilities if they have the capacity. Uh, and so to consider the sort of stagnation and social abilities that a human would undergo if they were deprived of social interactions from birth. Um, so uh, 
I think that's probably a, a slightly better approach than just giving like throwing in the towel and and uh, accepting these results. Um, I think that there's just still more more work to do before we uh, succumb. But yeah, that's pretty much. It. So what I'll do is is I'll uh, just I'll uh, watch for hands and whatnot, and then feed you to uh, uh, Doctor Pre or Mr. Prez for questions. So if you have questions, just raise your hands, and I'll keep it, keep track of the order of questions. Um, so and we will start with our own Doctor Garcia. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I guess I don't know. I, I have a, just a couple of like small comments that I'd like to hear your thoughts on, like how this weighs in on your project. So it turns out. Unfortunately, I can't provide a citation, but I do remember like how the experiment goes. Uh, human beings are really bad at reasoning when it comes to conditionals under certain contexts, right? So if you, there's this uh, little experiment, you have these like four cards, right? Uh, you may be familiar with this already. Yeah. On one side of the card, there's like a color, and on the other side of the card, there's a shape, and then there's a rule, right? And the rule just says like, if a card has like this shape on one side, then it must have this color on the other. Yeah. And then the subject is asked to pick the minimum number of cards that they would need to check to ensure that the rule has been followed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it turns out we are really bad at this, like horrible, right? We, uh, unless you have like formal education in logic or something, you won't be able to pick out the necessary and sufficient conditions, right? Uh, yeah. Check the yellow one, but not the green one, that kind of stuff. If we ran that experiment, and only that experiment on a bunch of human beings, you would get the conclusion that humans are really bad at this. Yeah. However, you can actually tweak the experiment and make it not about colors and, and symbols, something super abstract, but make it about the drinking age, right? Mm -hmm. You make it about the drinking age and ask about 16 year olds and like 22 year olds at a bar and ask who would you need to card? And the rule is the exact same kind of rule, right? It follows the same formal system. But we reason very successfully in that context, yeah. right? Same formal rules, same everything. But for some reason, under a different context, we're suddenly extremely good at reason, like just excellent at it. So this seems to me like a reason to agree with what you're saying, right? Which is like, look, we must not have devised like the right kinds of tests yet. It would be way too hasty to conclude that human beings are terrible at conditional reasoning simplicity. Right. For some reason, it seems like some modules are activated better under certain kinds of contexts. Mm -hmm. So that's like one thing that I would put forth, right? Which is just like here's, you know, some reason in the human case, right, to say that you need a better experiment. The other thing that I want to do, and this is more of a, of a question than it is a comment, it's not clear to me that the behavior reading is more parsimonious, right? It's not clear to me that that's simpler. Uh, it's so here's how the question would go, right? Why believe that that's simpler? And here's a, a, the challenge, right? It's easy to say, oh yeah, the, the chimp, right? They just have to look at like one or two behaviors and they just have these like two beliefs or these three beliefs. But the aggressive, the dominant uh, chimp could have, could manifest any sort of behavior, right? Why would it be, why would it not be that the uh, behavior, you know, let's say the behaviorist uh, about chimp psychology, why wouldn't they be forced to say something like, oh no, see the chimp has the following disjunctive behavior. Uh, dominant chimp will either do this or do that or do the other thing and suddenly things balloon really quickly. Why can't that just be like the response that it's not actually parsimonious? Yeah, okay. So for the for your first comment, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And you might even think that in, in like the, the human experiment, that it might even also just be the same context. It's just like the tools have somehow, have like somehow been changed. And this is like in line with some of what uh, others think that's going on in in the experiments that we devise for chimps um, because we often test them say, side by side or not not literally side by side but uh, we run the same sorts of experiments that we do with children like with human children that we do with chimps um, but when when we run these experiments the the humans are using the tools that they have the, the, like the artifacts that they have in their world you know that they're familiar with uh, uh, whereas with the chimps, we're using, we're asking to to use uh, something totally foreign to them. You know, often uh, using uh, artifacts of the human world to to devise experiments about false belief. And you know, if someone takes something out of a 
of a bucket or whatever, then you know what like what are they going to reason about about it? Um, so I, I agree with you that that's a, that's one way in which uh, it's been suggested that we can improve uh, some of these experiments um, and taking into account um, how the artifacts that we use uh, uh, can bear on whether or not they uh, demonstrate these abilities uh, like they might in for humans, you know. Um, mm -hmm. About, can you, what was the uh, second one? You just did it. Yeah, it's not obvious to me that. Um, oh, right. Yeah, but yeah. the behavior. Um, this is, there's a lot of literature, literature about this uh, specific logical problem. Um, it's definitely, I definitely oversimplified it. It's not as easy as like the behavior reading uh, hypothesis says, oh, there's only two beliefs that we need to attribute, and the mind reading attributes three. Uh, it gets into all sorts of uh, problems like, um, you know, the mind reading hypothesis might be uh, more complicated in terms of the number of beliefs that a subject has, whereas it might be less complicated in the number of systems that it needs to have or the number of representations that it needs to have in order to, to carry out the ability. Um, so, as you know, parsimony questions get complicated very quickly. Um, and often they're just intractable. Like someone can say, oh, well, yeah, I have this, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's also not clear to me that, definitely not clear to me that the BRH is simpler or more pars parsimonious. It was, just, I was mostly just presenting it as the problem and how this issue might bear on that. Um, so we have to consider what we say about this uh, and how that might affect uh, what we say about the logical problem. Yeah. Uh, Mark? Oh, cool. Uh, thank you for the talk, Trevor. That was, that was really cool. Um, so I, I, at the risk of like violating philosophical norms, I want to ask you a question that's like genuinely a question, not like a disguised objection or anything like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> which I guess has a preamble. Could you actually like back up a couple of slides? That's not my actual question, but like, could you guess? Thank you. Um, so, right. So it's a further, it was where, where you had this concerns about like the plausibility of a move. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it were. This oh one. man, I messed things up. I'll, I'll just run with it without the slide up there and see where we go. Okay. Um, so I, I take it that, that you had this at a concern that like it would be implausible to say that uh, the module was only effectively like being triggered in a like a conditional sense. Sorry, what was that? That the module was only being triggered like conditionally, like it, it kicked in under like some circumstances but not in others or whatnot and this seemed to be uh, a vile like you didn't see was like evolutionarily plausible is that the yeah okay okay so I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about why exactly you find that so implausible um because I mean just off the top of my head I mean I, it sounds like it intuitively could be reasonably plausible it I could mean, I know I agree it could be um it's it's about like because I mean some of the evolutionary arguments in favor of like uh, modularity are that um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, these sorts of systems are easy or easier to to like evolve right so instead of having like if brains just don't like evolve as wholes you know functioning brains uh, and so modularity uh, responds to that by like. Get offering this explanation where it's just a gradual addition of modules to, to these systems. Um, uh, my concern, I think, if I'm thinking of the right part that you're referring to, um, was, uh, wait, hold on. It's a little bit after this. After? It's there. There. there we go. There we go. Yeah, so it's not like that the, the module has to be triggered, it's the ability that has to be triggered. Right, so I mean, like, why, why would it be so implausible to say that, like, uh, there's a module that is only getting, you know, sent input under certain evolutionarily beneficial contexts, or maybe yeah. the module is always active, but it's being. I think, I mean, maybe, or, maybe this is what I had in mind. Um, so when you're coming up with an evolutionary explanation for, for something, um, 
part of the appeal is that these things are supposed to be beneficial and that, therefore that's why it explains that why it was selected for, right? So if you have these faculties, um, especially in social creatures, um, if you have these, these faculties activated in certain like one sort of context, um, it's definitely beneficial for them to have them in these other contexts as well. Um, so it's not like I can't imagine uh, some uh, animal developing uh, modules for one that are activated in one like with a, uh, in one sort of context and not another. It's just that it at least puts a little bit of tension. Maybe implausible is too strong, but at least it looks it puts a little bit of tension on. Uh, okay, but why only in these contexts? You know, you might be able to give a story. You know, these are more pressing contexts. You know, co competitive contexts are more pressing. Therefore, um, so. That's that's basically what I had in mind. Um, it puts a little bit of pressure on saying why, why in these contexts, why not in these contexts. Um, they're supposed to be the same sort of uh, ability, and they're supposed. To, I mean, we see in humans, we see them uh, these sorts of abilities as very uh, flexible and global, and very um, open to inputs from all sorts of different contexts. Um, so that's that's what I had in mind. Like, why the discrepancy there? Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Yeah, so I, I shared uh, Mark's. I, I had the same kinds of questions that that Mark did, and I want to just go a little a little farther uh, down that road with a, a, an example I concocted. Um, so I was thinking about a case that I was just thinking, okay, Carruthers sort of functional architecture, right? What could that look like? And I was thinking, okay, imagine a creature, an animal that has the concept of animacy. So it believes that there are living things that can move of their own accord. And you know those are the things that could be predators and things of that nature, right? But imagine that this concept of animacy is only triggered by visual cues. So if a thing in the world moves in a certain way, like if it sees a rock and that rock starts kind of skittering across the ground, it applies the concept of animacy in a way that goes beyond that, you know, individual rocks movement and it's sort of like, I don't want to be in the same room and attended with that thing, or I need to keep an eye on that, right? But imagine that this creature, while it has this concept of animacy, touch related cues just can't unlock it, right? So if it's touching things, you know, like in a tide pool that are slithering around, you know, that range of circumstances just can't activate this, you know, animacy, you know, concept. So I think in a way that's what, you know, that would be an architecture that would be kind of similar to Carruthers, right? Where it's like, maybe there's multiple visual cues yeah. and it can, that can lead it to judge that something's animate. And once it judges that something's animate, it can generalize across a bunch of visual contexts, but just can't do this to tactile contexts. Yeah. And so I don't think a cognitive architecture like that is, you know, hard to imagine or impossible. Um, I mean, it seems like in that case, like there are facts specific to perception and to how we're hooked up that make me think it would be odd, it would be odd just because touch and vision are integrated in most animals. Um, but it seems like you need some further sort of story about why. So if I wanted to try to say why it would be implausible for an animal to have this sense of animacy, but only be able to access it via touch related or sorry, visual related context, I would say something like, well, we sort of know these abilities to be related in other contexts, so it would be strange that they can't do it. And I guess I'm wondering what, what kinds of facts about chimpanzees from these experiments do you think, you know, makes it seem as if the cooperative con you know, context and the competitive ones, you know, that they really should be able to import across them. Right. Um, no. Yeah, no, th this is a great question. Um, so I, I definitely think that your case is super plausible, um, particularly because this is like a th this is like hooked up to a certain modality, right? Um, so I can see how that would work out. I have a little bit more trouble seeing how that would work out in like competitive versus cooperative context um, because th these aren't hooked up. These are supposed to be amodal, um, you know. There is there isn't something uh, as concrete in the cooperative or uh, competitive context that I can point to uh, where there's where we can say okay well this is why um, they're being uh, used in these contexts and and not in these others um, at least with your story we can we can point to like okay well we have these uh, different modalities right um, and we can see how that could affect uh, when these abilities are are activated. 
Um, I have more trouble seeing that for, for this case um, because they really aren't that different. The, these contexts really aren't that different. Um, they're still getting like, you know, in cooperative contexts, they're still getting the visual uh, and auditory uh, information or like inputs that they get from uh, competitive contexts. Um, so yeah, that maybe maybe that's one way in which we can go about this. Yeah. Cool. Jerry, um, have not, enough experiments been done to be sure that the differentiation is between competitive and cooperative context rather than some feet. I mean, if you just had these two experiments, I can think of a whole lot of things besides competitive and cooperativeness that might differentiate uh, the mind evidence for mind reading in one and not the other. So, but are there a whole lot of experiments, some cooperative and some competitive, and then does it follow along those lines? There have been quite a few experiments. Um, and that seems to be a good like line of demarcation um, for failure versus success. Um, there's all sorts of ex like experiments where um, where if you shift um, from competitive to cooperative context, then you get uh, a shift in failure versus uh, versus okay. success. Um, so I think that's probably it's probably relevant. You know, cooperative versus versus uh, competitive. It seems to be relevant to, to what's going on, and what and like, it seems to be contributing to whether or not they pass or fail. Um, I have definitely haven't uh, dug through all the literature, but this seems to be like a a, a, a common uh, interpretation of what's going on. Uh, that thinking of fear, a fearfulness of the context, yeah, having kind of an uh, evolutionary efficacy, it'd be hard to imagine a competitive one that isn't fearful and a cooperative one that is. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, this goes back to like what Andrews is saying, like we, we, there might be all sorts of factors that we're not accounting for when we're running these experiments uh, that we should be. Um, and they, they might be falsely indicating to us that the, the actual uh, relevant point uh, that changes is cooperative versus competitive. So I agree with you. It's just hard to say. Yeah. I'm going to throw in one for myself. Um, and this is a kitchen sink question. <laughs> it's just like, I'm going to say a bunch of stuff. If you can make sense of it, please do. Uh, so I want to start by thinking about like cheater detection and like fairness modules and things like that. You know, the experiments were like, you give you give the chimp something, but then he sees you give a better reward to a different chimp. They like then they just toss the you know they'll throw the great bat and get all busy and you know all upset. Um, so one thing about that, and I'll it, that seems to be if that's modular though, that seems very much to depend upon some kind of perspective taking because it doesn't happen just you know if they don't think that they, they seem to have to have this idea of what's your thinking and we're thinking and there's something there that's going on and i want to think that that's very similar to uh the sort of uh or the competitive situation you're thinking of right it's, it's along the same sorts of lines yeah and i want to think that cooperation is really 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 hard and it would come down the road from there because we know just trying to get two people to carry a log together yeah. is one of the most difficult tasks that can be done for like humans to do it because it's me representing you about what i'm going to do in response to what you're going to do so that we carry it in sync yeah. so what about the thought that just like yeah we def we develop these sort of like basic capacities in sort of very defensive ways because they're the more important ways early and that cooperation is just so much harder that it's going to require module upon module upon module upon module kind of thing yeah okay so no kitchen sink at you no that's that's a great concern um i don't have too much to say about this uh I guess my, my thought is that, um, again, I think it's much more plausible to, to think that, well, first of all, we, we know that champs are super cooperative, right? They hunt together, they coordinate, 
Uh, they, they make calls to warn others about impending doom, whatever. Um, they teach each other skills. They, they're, I think they're super cool. And it's something I talked to Yancel earlier about. It's like, it's, it's weird how much of the literature talks about how, uh, how uncooperative chimps are. And I'm, and I'm thinking, it's like, what, where's this coming from? They're super cooperative. Um, but uh, again, I think that it's, I don't know, it's kind of like hopefulness that maybe we shouldn't be, uh, no, it's totally fine to consider, maybe th this is what's going on. Um, we certainly see other abilities that we have that they don't, you know, that, that we probably just evolved after or later. Um, but um, I don't know, the fact that, that they do sometimes seem to, to, uh, to demonstrate these abilities might, I think it should make us hopeful and more, uh, uh, you know, just willing to, to run better experiments. Um, so I, I don't have too much good to say about that. I agree with you that that's definitely a concern. It might be what's going on. So um, is it just a follow-up since I've got the floor? Yeah. Um, uh, so one thought would be, is it possible that sort of what Yonsel was kind of hinting at, like what's really going on is, is maybe they are cooperative, but cooperation is really, really, really difficult because it requires this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this is just one of case where like they're failing. It's not that they're not mind reading. It's just that to be able to get all of that stuff, that many back and oh, forth correct, that they're just, they're just failing at it. And so it's part one and part two is, if they're not mind reading, does it become like next to impossible to figure out how we're ratcheting up, thinking about the cheater modules and stuff like that, that we seem to have those cheater modules and fairness modules as well. If you think they have them, it looks like we have them. And we go from that to those seem to sort of, you know, uh, uh, get us moving up the ladder towards something like a, like, proto morality or something like that right like if they're not already doing something in the mind reading game how the heck do you go from something like them to something like us right given that they're they're oh, we're, we're at the same base level at the uh, the, the fairness module kind of thing so those are two right. more thoughts yeah i don't know i mean it might just be you know a problem of like level of complexity um where you know, they have some of these abilities, they have some of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, they have a cheater module, whatever we have that cheater module, theirs isn't, theirs isn't, uh, th theirs doesn't go along with some other modules that we have that allow us to, uh, to have like morality and make, you know, evaluative judgments, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> it, it might just be a level of like the level of complexity, uh, more modules, I have no idea. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's hard to say, you know, I'm not sure. Okay, we've got uh, Jacob here, and then we've uh, got Laura back there. Does the research presuppose that the researchers can read the minds of the chimp, of <laughs> purportedly, chimp, purportedly mind reading chimps? And if so, does it need to? Because uh, there might be some way you could do the research in which the researchers don't need to read the minds of the purportedly mind reading chimps, although that seems implausible to me. Um, has this issue come up in, the, in your research or in your investigations? Do you, do you like, do you think it would be, it's like a problematic uh, yes. supposition? Why, why do you, would you think? Oh, because you're putting the cart before the horse. Um, if we, I mean, we're presuming, if we, if the research requires that the research- Oh, you mean just specific do, in sort of mind reading? Yeah, um, so maybe we have different kinds of mind reading involved here. So um, it could be the case that the researchers are reading the minds of the, of the chimps um, in a way that does not presuppose the particular mind reading that the chimps are doing of each other. Mm -hmm. um, but then we'd have to be really clear about making the distinction between how the researchers are discerning things about this, the mental states of chimps um, on the one hand, and how chimps are discerning things about the mental states of other chimps on the other hand. Yeah, I mean, it might just be the, the, the it's the problem of other minds, pretty much. You know, we have to, we only have so much to go on uh, when we're trying to make determinations about uh, the minds of other creatures. Um, so, you know, we have to go by things like 
you know, what sorts of things do we do? Like what sorts of billies do we, we have? Um, how are they probably carried out? Um, and then, you know, try to devise some experiments where they give us some behaviors to interpret. And we have to interpret those through the lens of uh, what we are familiar with. Um, so maybe it's problematic, but we also, uh, you know, very close relatives. So it's not too far of a stretch to think that uh, we roughly work uh, in similar ways. Um, mm. yeah. So we do have to make some presuppositions about our own mind reading capabilities. Yeah, I think so. Laura, you want to last question for us? Kind of maybe interesting to follow up with because I'm also curious about whether or not uh, mind reading itself or the mind reading hypothesis implies a simple ability. Uh, and a simple? The, yeah, in other words, it seems like, and maybe I'm getting this wrong, and this it was all really interesting, and I want to know all these, <laughs> these many things, um, but it sounds like there's this simple ability, mind reading, that is presupposed that they have because they demonstrate it in context one, and then since they can't demonstrate it in context two or three or four, we have to assume that there's something modular about the ability itself, and that explains why the failure is happening. But, but why not just assume that there is some symbol of mind reading, but what we've seen success in is just one sub variety of it. And then other sub varieties we maybe have not learned how to access. Or, you know, this is in some ways a response to what William was saying about maybe we just haven't detected the kind of mind reading you're doing in these other cases. Or maybe it's that the, the um, type of mind reading we really should be talking about as modular is a, is a larger one. No, I mean, I think that that goes along with with what I'm uh, saying as well. Um, I yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with you. There's there's a lot more to be said about about uh, what's going on here than just like okay, let's give up on it and let's uh, let's figure out out a way to explain this away while retaining the ability. Um, yeah, so I guess the only uh, I mean, the best pass path forward I see is just devising different, better experiments. Uh, it's always going to be tough to say. There's always going to be uh, different interpretations that we um, that we can give. We can give behavior reading interpretations, but it's about, at least for this, it's about just eliminating uh, this point of contention, you know, that they don't mind read in cooperative contexts. Uh, and if we do that, I think it puts the mind reading hypothesis in like a slightly better position. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you, thank you. Well, I think we're gonna follow Mark's really strange thing and we're gonna finish the first session on time and take only a five minute break, only five minute break, but let's thank our speaker.